So I, I pray that um, everyone has uh, appreciated the, uh, the goodness that has come to us through uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians. I, I just really appreciated um, preparing um, through this book and just seeing all the richness that God has for us there. Um, today we're going to be nearing the end of our series in, in this book, and um, we're, uh, I've, I've got two more messages in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, today we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, um, verses 12 to 15. And um, I'd like to talk to you today about living with healthy attitudes. And uh, let's bow in a word of prayer and ask God's blessing on his word. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us through it. And God, there's so much we can learn. And, and God, we, we, we just honor you today. Um, open our hearts, God, to see your word for what it is and, and what you would like us to heed through it. And we praise you for the opportunity that we have to, to be together and to go through it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So in context this morning, we see, we see that Paul has uh, just settled the minds of his congregation as to the blessed hope that they have in the second coming of Jesus. And uh, for all that don't know, Jesus is coming soon. Amen? He is. He's coming soon. We don't know the day or the hour, but Jesus is coming soon. And Paul, even at this time in the early church, wanted people to live as though Jesus would be coming at any moment. And Paul loved the people of this church. And at the end of this book, you can feel his pastor's heart for them um, in the way that he expressed uh, the last several paragraphs of, of chapter 5. And um, see, Paul longed for the Thessalonians, and, he, and, and I believe all the way through history, the Lord used this book um, to, to speak to all of us, here today included, you know, 2,000 years after the fact. He, he longs to see the people of the church spiritually healthy and flourishing, experiencing all the good things that the Christian life was intended to bring. Now, Paul exhorted the church to live orderly and peaceful lives, actively seeking to do what is best for the furtherance of God's kingdom. And that's kind of the flavor of this last chapter. And he does this, and we're going to talk this morning about it, by encouraging believers to develop and, and maintain healthy attitudes for a living. And our text this morning is that, is that uh, tw verses 12 to 15. So the first thing that Paul speaks to the Thessalonians about is having a healthy attitude towards leadership. Now he says in verse 12 and 13, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Now the Bible likens the calling of a pastor to a group of people what a shepherd's responsibility is to a flock of sheep. God has established a clear covering of authority over his church. And instructions are given to pastors by the Apostle Peter, who instructs in 1 Peter chapter 5, 2-3, he says this, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. God wants you as willing God, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Among other things, as pastors, uh, we're called by God to work hard to lead the congregation entrusted to our care, to pastures 
of nutritious spiritual food. We see in Psalm 23 that the Lord is our shepherd. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd, but he's also appointed men to be under shepherds, under his authority, to carry out his work. We're called to spiritual oversight, to protect and to lead the flock away from the harm that might come if they were other, if the, the congregation was left otherwise to fend for themselves. A pastor is called to make an honest living and to encourage and admonish the congregation to walk in a way that is worthy of their God-given call. To admonish, friends, means to caution, to reprove gently, to warn. And while its tone is brotherly, um, I think you could say that its tone is actually big brotherly. And um, the reason we say that is that, um, you know, I am a child of God under Christ's authority, and I am your brother. There's no, there's no difference between us. We're the same under Christ. But I do have a calling to be a big brother um, to you guys, to encourage you in your walk of faith to pursue the things that will make you strong and healthy, that will make you effective in your lives. So a pastor labors, he provides oversight and he admonishes. The Lord desires that, that people that have the calling to pastor would be eager to serve people with glad and sincere hearts and, and to break the bread off, the bread of life that's been placed inside of their heart, in this case my heart, to break it off and to give it to you because man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And my, my task this morning to you and calling to you this morning is to bring the word of God to you in clarity, prayerfully, in, in, in an understanding that God's word is, is what you need to make it through the day, to, to not just make it through the day, but to live a life that's worthy of the call, to live a life that's that's not just ordinary, to live a life that's abundant in Christ. And I share this with you this morning. It's difficult to preach this. You see, I, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea of what I'm trying to say here. I, I don't want to be one of those people that lord my God-given authority over you. I, I don't want that. I, I'm not preaching this point in my sermon with any kind of agenda outside of ensuring that I'm a faithful expositor of God's word because the power is not in the presenter. The power is in the Lord and in his word. So I say this, that you would forgive me for the times when I am not a perfect vessel. I'm human and I make mistakes and sometimes I'm going to make the wrong calls. I'm going to, I might say something wrong. I might do something wrong unintentionally. And sometimes maybe the flesh in me gets the better of me. And I do something that's wrong and I need to apologize for those times. But, but we're all together in this. We're all together in this. God's truth is needed to bring all of us here a well-rounded, healthy, balanced, spiritual diet we want to be a people of the Word of God. We can't do this on our own. This isn't a, ma a matter of, you know, trying our very best to be the very best people that we can be. And that's good. And that's what, no. It's about submitting ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, to His Lordship. Taking His Word at face value, and not just taking it at face value to be hearers of the Word, but to be doers of the Word. Because that's what God's calling us to. He wants us to be doers of his word. So I want to encourage you today to practice what God's word says. Not solely for my benefit. Although, I'll tell you this much, as a pastor, it's surely beneficial to me when 
the people that have been entrusted under my care by the Lord are obedient to God. But that's not solely why I want to encourage you to do what God's word says, right? Even though I am a beneficiary. But the health of the work of Christ in this assembly, which overflows into this community, it overflows into the various ministries that we participate in overseas. It's important for the health of those things, for the glory of God. I don't know about you, but the day of the Lord is coming soon. And I want to see people get saved. People need Jesus. If you're here this morning and you've never surrendered to Jesus, you need to. Oh, man. You guys know we've received the bread of life and there is a life in Christ. And we want to see people in our community, people that we are associated to in our, in our missions that we're supporting, saved, delivered, and healed by the power of God because we're all sinners and we need Him. We need Him. So, Paul calls believers everywhere to acknowledge your pastors and to show them love and respect. And I want to say this, not for the title, not for the person, but for the importance of the work that they are doing in the furtherance of God's kingdom and their labor on behalf of God's people to see people come to maturity in the faith. The Lord told his original apostles to go to make disciples. And that's our task too, is to make disciples, to see each one in this place come to full maturity in Christ and to pass it on to the next person that you come into contact with. So the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be no benefit to you. In our text this morning, in tandem with encouraging the people to have a proper view of leadership, Paul says that as people who make up the church, we should make every effort. You see, this is not by mistake. He says, this is tagged on to this. He says, make every effort to live at peace with each other. Folks, there's nothing more disheartening and discouraging to any pastor than to see people in his congregation acting selfishly and becoming embroiled in needless conflicts with one another. There's stuff that just doesn't need to be brought to the table. There's going to be differences that you have with the person sitting next to you. It's just inevitable. With this many people and this many hearts and relationships and different, different upbringings and all that kind of stuff, it's inevitable that you're going to have differences with one another. But God does not want us to seek out our own interests, but to have the interests of others in, at, in our hearts. That's what he wants. I can vouch for what both Paul and the writer to the Hebrews says here, the, the greatest gift, you want to know what blesses my heart the most as a pastor? The greatest gift of love, joy, and respect that a pastor could ever receive from the congregation is to see that people are loving and respecting one another and being imitators of Christ wherever they go. And this despite all of the diversity of opinions and perspectives and personalities within any congregation. So then, Paul addresses this. Awkward for me to talk about it, but that's what, it, uh, that's what the Word of God says, and that's what the Lord wants you to know today, because it's good for you. It's good for me. It's good for us. So, Paul continues with his thoughts along this line, urging the Thessalonians to live at peace with others in the congregation and to be active as peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. God desires that not only should the believers have healthy attitudes towards their leaders, but also that they would have healthy attitudes towards each other as brothers and sisters. So he says in verse 14, and we urge you, 
brothers and sisters, to warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. And Paul uses these family terms of endearment to describe how he relates to others in the church and how others in the church ought to relate to one another. You're not just Joe Schmo, right? You're not just Joe Schmo. You're, you're a brother or you're a sister of mine. And the people sitting next to you in the Lord, they are your brothers and sisters. Now, I know some of us come from dysfunctional family units where there's brokenness all over the place and maybe you never really learned how to be part of a good family. But the family of God here, God wants us to, to relate to one another in wholeness and, and to care for one another. Men treat the ladies like sisters. Sisters treat the men like brothers. That's a family term, a family endearment. This is the family of God. We were meant to walk through this world not like individuals on our own kind of, you know, no. God wants us to walk together as a family. Now, I understand the brokenness in this world because there's sin. And where there's sin, there's corruption. And where there's corruption, there's brokenness. And we forge we get forged sometimes in brokenness. So we're broken. And I can't relate to the person next to me because I'm broken. Well, I'm telling you this much, that there is a God in heaven who saves, delivers, and heals. And if you're broken this morning because of brokenness that's been happened or that has happened in your life, there is a, a, a Savior who cares very much for your spirit, who wants you to be healed, who wants you to be whole, who wants you to be able to be open instead of being guarded. The natural tendency when we're wounded is to guard ourselves and to isolate ourselves and to live like islands unto ourselves where we don't fellowship with anyone else. We just kind of stick it out alone. That's not what God's intention is. And sometimes, folks, people that have had open hearts get hurt by others in the church. And that's why the teaching that we have today is here. Right? Because we're not, we're not perfect. We're on the road to being perfected. Jesus wants us to be sanctified, to become more and more like him, to, to be used for his purposes. But we haven't arrived yet, so we need to give each other grace. Man, if you've hurt someone, you need to say sorry. <laughs> not just say sorry, but ask for their forgiveness and, 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 and draw near to that person and and just say, listen, I, I'm so sorry. I, I snapped at you today. There was other things on my mind, or I ignored you today. I shouldn't have done that. I brushed you off. I, I had something I'm working on. Be humble with one another. See? Now, Paul's thoughts are that if we don't follow rules in a family... And if everyone is out to fulfill their own agendas where people are pulling in opposite directions, what's the grand result going to be? It's going to be chaos. We're not going to see the health in the body of Christ that, that the Lord desires to, for us to experience. Church filled with chaos has people pulling for their own agenda. There's power struggles everywhere. and That, that church is not going to be effective. It's going to shatter. It's going to break apart. It's going to shrink and it's going to die. You know, if love grows cold for the Lord and love grows cold for one another, the Lord will remove that candlestick from its place. We're church. We're like a candlestick stuck here on this hill, shining light into the community. But you know, if we don't love one another and we don't love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we lose our first love, God will remove our candlestick from its place. This church will fade and it will be gone. This assembly. We don't want that. What Morgan was saying, Lord, if the Lord tarries, we want this place to be vibrant. We want this to be a place where people find healing and, and joy and family, connectedness when there's brokenness and darkness and dysfunction out there. Anyway. So, we are a collective testimony of God's grace displayed uniquely. 
And God takes joy in seeing you blossom. You might not feel like you're blossoming right now. But guess what? The Lord wants you to be. He wants to prune you and care for you and water you and nourish you so that now your life, although it may seem barren, becomes a blossoming tree that is planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatsoever you doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not like that, right? They're like the chaff that the wind drives away. But you, my friends, are children of God, called by his name, called to bear fruit of righteousness and to be flourishing, and living abundantly. Oh my God, my gosh. You know, we, we think of ourselves sometimes too much. And if you think of yourself all the time, you're going to be looking at yourself and, and trying to fill all the holes. You know, if you think about yourself and you focus on the pains and the injuries and the damages that have been done to you and all that, you're never going to flourish. It's only when you turn your eyes off yourself and turn your eyes onto Jesus that he begins to fill those holes. He begins to give you a new perspective in the spirit that he desires. Okay, so Paul goes on. He says, okay, first of all, he wants people um, to live he wants people to live in productivity and in peace. And he wants us to warn each other not to be idle and disruptive. What disturbs peace amongst brethren? Idleness is one of the big ones. Paul exhorts with great urgency for us to warn each other when idleness roosts. You see, when we're idle, when we're just sort of sitting there and doing nothing but gathering to ourselves and not serving God in his kingdom and not invested in the body of Christ, the tendency is for us to steep. Steep and think about things that are not productive, are not right. Now, our sin nature that we've been saved from still tags along, and we've got to put it down. Every day, we have to surrender that to the Lord. And if we're just idling around, you're never, you're never just staying in one place when you're idling. In the spiritual realm, when you're idling, you're going backwards. You're either going forward you're going backwards. Because if you give room for your sin nature to have, um, have dominance in you, and I've said this before in the past, that within every Christian is two dogs. And the dog that you feed is the one that grows the biggest and the strongest. If you feed your sin nature by being idle and, and just thinking about how you can survive for yourself and not thinking about anyone else, that dog will grow bigger and bigger and stronger. That sin nature will dominate you. And you'll find that you won't be able to, to be productive or effective in your faith. But if you allow the Lord to take you and to surrender your life to service, in service to Him, then that spiritual man, that spiritual woman inside you will grow stronger and stronger and God will, 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 will take that and that will become the dominating influence in your life. And collectively as a church, when everybody is in that state where they're looking to Christ to serve him, you have a strong church, a church that is vibrant, a church that is, that is, li is full of life and that shines brightly in the darkness. Fo folks, we got some good things happening here, but we don't want to assume that if we just idle, that it's not going to regress. There's some good things God's put on people's hearts, and people are serving the Lord very effectively in different places, but 
Um, you see, we need to be productive. We need to be not idling. And, and when you're idling, the tendency is for church groups to get together or people to get together and just sort of talk about things. And when it, what inevitably, inevitably happens when that happens is people start to gossip. Gossip. Oh, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Did you hear about this? You know, those kind of things are not productive. When we serve the Lord and we, and we talk about our brothers and sisters, what we should be talking about is how to build them up. Gossip needs to get shut down. It's the product of idleness. Um, Proverbs 26, 21, and 22 um, King Solomon said this. He said, As charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. The words of gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the innermost parts. It's very tasty to sit and ruminate about other people's lives and that kind of stuff, but it's not right. And it's quarrelsome. And the, Paul, Paul says here, if you see this, warn those that are idle and disruptive. Warn them. Why? for their own good and for the good of the congregation. If you just let that go, I mean, like if I'm, if I'm saying something wrong about somebody, I, I would expect someone to come to me and say, hey, pastor, you know, that's not really nice. That's not right. You shouldn't be, those people are people that Christ died for, and you don't know the full story here. You don't know the full story. You're, 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 you're parroting what you think you know, but you don't really know. We need to shut it down when it starts happening. That's fleshly. It's not of the Spirit. Divisiveness and laziness brings um, ineffectiveness to a church. Second Thessalonians, you see, Paul wrote this in the letter to the, to the Thessalonians in his first letter. But apparently this hadn't sunk in totally. <laughs> How do you, you guys ever feel like that? You know, sometimes the word of God comes to you and you're like, I wish I wasn't just so thick. <laughs> ah, God, help me. I'm so thick sometimes. You are too, but. <laughs> sometimes we just don't get it. We need to be told over and over again and reminded, right? But in this particular case, with this particular issue that we're talking about here in First Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians, in his second letter, Paul addresses it and goes further because apparently the gossiping and the idleness and the disruptiveness was continuing and those that were warned were not heeding it. So what he says here, he says, Paul goes in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. Woo. Keep away from them. Warn them. But I'm telling you, if you're going for coffee at someone's place and they just won't stop it, and you say, listen, we can't talk about sister so-and-so this way. It's not proper. And the next time you go there, and they, I want to talk about sister and sister, sister so-and-so again. You know, and they start into it again. It's like, no. Like, this isn't right. And if that person persists in that behavior, you, you can't hang out with them. You know, sin is, is so easily spread. I think uh, in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, Paul says to the Ephesians, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works that anyone can boast. We've heard tons of sermons, tons of illustrations, tons of teaching on those two verses, right? And it's true. For by grace are you saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. We're not here because we've earned the right to be God's children. We're here because God has had mercy on us, because he's had grace on us. But let's go further. You see, the next verse doesn't get spoken about as much. So it's, for the, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God does care about idleness. 
He does care about disruptiveness. He wants us to participate with him in his good work of discipling others, of building up one another, of sharing the message of Christ in a world that is broken and needs Jesus. Yes, that entails us getting off of our seat, standing up, and marching forward to do something good. That is not... We're not just here to soak and steep. We're here to engage. Life as a Christian is all about engagement. Engaging with what God's want, wanting to do in our culture, in our surroundings, in the lives of others. So, when it comes to any sin, any sin, including laziness and disruption... A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. That's what it says in Galatians 5, 9. So if there's gossiping, if there's disruption going on, we need to shut it down. You need to be a catalyst in that, both for yourself and warn others if they're doing it too. Don't just go, oh, that's nice. Nobody likes confrontation. I know that. But we can't have this. We can't have this working its way into the batch of dough or, or it's going to destroy the work that God desires to do through us, the candlestick will be removed from its place. A church unchecked in gossip, folks, is a church that will go down. God does not desire that. He desires health. Anyway. Mm. So, moving on. There's lots of meat in here, eh? It's easy to become discouraged. Who here has been discouraged? Who here has been really discouraged sometimes? <laughs> it's easy for us to find ourselves getting discouraged because we're human. We have thoughts, feelings, emotions, and physical limitations. Sometimes we're discouraged because of physical calamity. Sometimes we're f discouraged because of family circumstances or someone else you know, doing something to us that hurts us. Um, sometimes we're discouraged just because the immensity of the task that we're faced with. There, there's all kinds of reasons why Christians get discouraged. But God calls us to encourage those who are discouraged. He calls you to be your brother's keeper, to be your sister's keeper. Remember in the Garden of Eden in that, in that era, in the beginning of the, of, of the world? In the beginning of creation, there's Cain and Abel, right? We see how Cain ended up killing Abel because he was jealous and how there was evil in his heart. And one of the things that God asked him, he says, where's Abel? He says, I don't know. I don't know where Abel is. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, apparently he didn't think he was. And that's part of the sin. Folks, here today, you are your brother's keeper and your sister's keeper. You are. You are responsible before God to keep your eyes open, to keep the radar up and say, who here is discouraged? Who needs a word of encouragement? Who needs help to further, um, to further advance in their, in their walk with Christ? Who needs that? That's our responsibility. In a loving, functional family. I'm talking loving and functional here, right? Brothers and sisters look out for one another. That's what a loving and functional family is. In a dysfunctional family, brothers and sisters are at odds with one another, compete with one another, and beat each other up. But God's family, God's family is functional, is to be functional because He is at the helm. Who is the head of the family? Thank the Lord, it's Jesus Christ. Jesus. So, there are times, my friends, even those of us who are generally zealous and optimistic about life, there are times when we will have difficult days. God wants you to encourage your heart today to know that 
Your circumstances might look bleak, but he calls you to cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Your heart might be broken, but God still is on the throne and he's in control of all things. Go to him. Go to a brother or sister and have them pray for you. And folks, if you see a, someone that is hurting and you recognize it on their face, get up off your hiney here, out of your chair, and go over to them and pray for them. You don't have to be Jeremiah or Isaiah or Paul the Apostle. You don't have to have some prestigious position or be a pastor or whatever. You don't have to have that. You are a child of God and God wants to use you to minister to your brothers and sisters. So, get up. When you see someone that needs it, go and encourage them. Be like Barnabas. My life, I look at it. I was at a minister's retreat here, a minister's conference last two weeks ago. And um, I realized something while I was there. <laughs> I started out in the ministry with a call of God in my life, fire in my, in my belly to, to be a servant of God and preach the word of God and to, to be a pastor. And I ran into some really difficult scenarios as a young man, and I was immature. I admit it. I wasn't ready. <laughs> well, I mean, God uses us wherever we are, and, and God did use me. But I came up with some obstacles and I took some wrong turns. As a matter of fact, I became one who went running away from the ministry like, ah, get me out of here. I can't take this. I don't want to do this anymore. And, and for 21 years, I cycled through lessons. But the call of God's always there. And I'm not saying it. Everyone's got different callings. What I'm saying is sometimes we can let life wound us to the place where we back off of the calling that God's given to us, no matter what it is. Maybe you're not a pastor. Maybe you're an, en an encourager, and you have the gift of encouragement, and somewhere along the line, someone really hurt you. And now, now you're not an encourager anymore because you don't want to put yourself out there because you don't want to be hurt. And for years and years and years and years, you've, you've pushed away from the table of the gifting that God's given you to be an encourager, or to be, to be a helper, or to, to be a pastor, or to be a teacher, to be a, a servant of God in different capacities, maybe even to work with your hands. There's so many different gifts. There's a multitude of different gifts, and all of us are different, but you've pushed away from the table because you've been wounded. Oh, my friends, God wants to restore you, just like he did with me. I'm not perfect. I'm a broken person that's been filled with the Spirit and God has taken the shards of my life, and I was telling someone about this, a couple people about this this week, and, and the shards of my life have been put back together by God and welded by the gold of the Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful that God takes broken people like me and like you and welds us back together. And then he shines his light in us and makes this unique, um, you see, unique work of art where his light shines through all the brokenness that was, was there, and he heals us and he makes us whole. And, our, and the light refracts through those fractures that are welded back with his gold. And it becomes a unique work of art. See, the Lord's light shines in you. Let his, let his healing come into you. Let him touch you. See, on Paul's journey. He, uh, he started out on his first missionary journey with um, Barnabas and John Mark, the author, otherwise called Mark, the guy that wrote the book of Mark. They were all together. And somewhere along the line, they went to this place on the missionary field. And Mark got sidelined. He let something get to him. And you know what he wanted to do? He, maybe it was just all the Gentile work that they were seeing and just such the unfamiliarity. I don't know what it was, the hardships. We don't know, but 
he, his heart went back home because he was from Jerusalem. So he abandoned the mission and he went back home and he went to, to Jerusalem. And, and, and God wasn't done with him. God used the circumstances in Jerusalem to teach him and to build him back up. He spent time with Peter, I believe. And there, there, there's just this time frame where he was away from the mission. And Paul was really upset at him. It's like, this guy abandoned us right when we needed him the most. He was our te- on our team. Maybe you feel like John Mark. Maybe you abandoned your mission at one point. But you know something? God is in the business of teaching us even through our brokenness. Bringing us back. John Mark came back. Barnabas. Barnabas, guess what? Barnabas means son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas means. God used Barnabas to bring John Mark back to where he should be. To where he should be serving the Lord. Barnabas says to Paul, hey man, we should take John Mark back with us on the next missionary journey. And Paul's like, are you kidding? This guy's like un- unreliable. I'm not bringing him on the, the mission. It's like, wow. Barnabas had this, this session with Paul where they, they butted heads about this whole issue. They had a sharp disagreement on this issue. Paul then took Silas and went off onto a second missionary journey and Barnabas took John Mark onto his journey. But you know what God did in the process of all this? He doubled up the gospel, uh, <laughs> the gospel thrust that he wanted into the world where John Mark and, and Barnabas went out and you know, there's not a lot written about it in the Bible because it's written from Paul's perspective, right? But they did great work for Christ in, on the mission. And Paul and Silas did great work for Christ on the mission. God used both of, even Paul's reluctance to forgive and to bring John Mark back, that worked into God's favor and the gospel went out more powerfully. And in the end, when Paul's dying days, when he was, he was talking to Timothy, it's evident that Paul saw how John Mark had come back and had been faithful and was used in the mission. He said in 2 Timothy 4.11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him here with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. So going from, hey, I don't want this guy to come on the mission field. As a matter of fact, Barnabas, if you want him to come, I'm not going with you to this because he is helpful to me in my ministry. See, God has a way of bringing things around. So if you here are, are facing something like that where you've been broken, if you know someone here who's been broken, be a Barnabas. Be a son of encouragement. Help. Help those who are in those circumstances. This is why Paul is saying right here, he says, encourage the disheartened, the discouraged. Help the weak. And be patient with everyone. I'm glad God's patient with me and I'm glad you're patient with me. Especially when I preach too long. But this is really important, folks. This is really, really, really important. Being encouraged. Be a Barnabas to the person next to you. Look around. If there's someone that's weak, maybe their faith is weak and they're, and they're having a difficult time, come alongside them. They need an arm. To, God can use you to be an encouragement and strength to them. And then he, and the, the last verse we're going to talk about this morning is verse 15, and, and Paul says, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. And the Thessalonians, I mean, they were persecuted, unlike what we have here today. They were, they were really persecuted, and it must have been hard for them not to try to get even with those who are treating them so unjustly, right? Isn't it hard when someone treats you unjustly to treat them well? People might do wrong to us. They may paint us with the wrong brush, but we must travel a different path than our human anger or sense of injustice tells us that we should travel. We must deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow the Lord. In Romans 12, 17 to 21, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, 
but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become overcome by evil, but, become, but overcome evil with good. You hear what he's saying here? And that thing about the coals isn't talking about burning your, you know, <laughs> burning the person that does evil. God's going to get you. Ha, ha, ha. Burn, burn, burn. You know, like that's not what it's saying here. When you do good to those that, that hurt you, who do evil towards you, okay, it will make them th- ashamed of the way that they've treated you because they see the goodness of how you respond appropriately. That's what it means. Yes, it's gonna, they're going to be, oh, like what? How can this person be this way when I've treated them so badly? Have you ever had someone do that, actually? When they've treated you really badly and you give them grace and you, you treat them well? It kind of blows their mind, doesn't it? <laughs> and sometimes I've, ha- I've had people come to me and say, why, why do you treat me this way when all I've done is kick you? Why do you treat me this way? What is it? I, I had a chance to pray for someone in a circumstance like that once. For Peter says the same. Do not repay evil with evil. First Peter 3.9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. And this is what God calls us to do as his children. Strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. We will inherit a blessing from the Lord. This is a promise because adopting this attitude is adopting the attitude of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus was about to be crucified, how that group of people, including Judas, came down to take him away. And Peter's all like, oh, how dare you, you guys. Pulls out his sword and he chops off the high, high priest's servant's ear. What did Jesus do? He says, Peter, put away your sword. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by it. And he stoops down and he picks up the severed ear. And he goes up and he glues it onto the guy's head and heals him right there. That's what he did. And they still crucified him. They still took him away. And they beat him and they crucified him. They mistreated him. But you see, this is, this is Christ's example to us, folks. So it doesn't matter what this world throws at us. We belong to Jesus. We belong to the King of Kings. And he wants us to be treating the others that abuse us, that abuse their authority over us, that, that hurt us, regardless of how evil men react to us when we do good to them. We will receive a harvest of righteousness when we deny ourselves, pick up our crosses, and we follow him. Amen? Amen. God bless you. The team, if you guys would come forward, we're just going to... We're going to close in that song again, May the Words of My Mouth, because that's really, that's really what it's all about. Let's pray before we close in the song, and then after the song, we'll, uh, we'll be dismissing everyone. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us such richness in your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with our cares, and you see our brokenness. God, for those that are broken this morning that need a healing touch from you, we pray, God, that you would touch people that need healing. For those, Father, who need to be um, encouraged, I pray that you would encourage them. For those that are needing to be warned about following a path that's not productive for themselves or the church, God, we pray that that would sink in too. I don't know, Lord, but you know the hearts of people, so God, our desire this morning as a church here in this little town, a hundred mile BC, God, we desire to live a life that pleases you. This is what we desire, Lord. Would you have mercy on us, God, and, and restore us where we're broken, where we need to be restored? In Jesus' name, amen.